It's an Olympic Games like never before. No crowds of supporters in Tokyo because of COVID-19, but plenty of politics. How's that affected this great sporting event? This is Inside Sport. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. As the Tokyo Olympics come to an end this Sunday, a year late because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some athletes and their nations are celebrating their medals, while others will be looking at where they can improve in three years' time in Paris. What has arguably been the world's biggest sporting event has always been a chance for nations big and small to showcase themselves on the grandest of stages. Historically, the prestige of the athletes' medal podium has been an opportunity for governments to promote a kind of soft power of culture and influence rather than the hard power of wealth and military might. But have some countries now crossed that line? And do the games still have the same impact for the medal-winning nations and the hosts? We'll be asking those questions and more with our guests in a moment. But first, let's take a look at some of the major events involving the games and politics. In 1936, Nazi Germany hosted the Olympics, but it only allowed what it referred to as the Aryan race to represent Germany, further marginalizing its Jewish population. In the 1960s, apartheid South Africa was banned from competing in what was the Tokyo Olympics, but only after it had already been allowed to use an all-white team to compete. During the same decade, in 1968, in Mexico, American athletes used their podium wins to raise awareness about racism, a move that had them kicked out of those Olympics. And in 1980, the United States led a boycott of the Games in Moscow as a response to the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. The irony now being that the U.S. invaded Afghanistan 21 years later. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our guests in London, Ontario. Richard Bucker, adjunct fellow and Olympic scholar and co-director of the Proposed Olympic Research Network. In Tokyo, we have Barbara Holtus, deputy director of German Institute for Japanese Studies and editor of Japan through the lens of the Tokyo Olympics. And in Doha, Ross Griffin, a Middle East editor of Inter the International Journal of the History of Sports. Good to have you all with us. Um, so, Barbara, let me start with you then, since you are uh, where it's all happening right now. Um, I think it's fair to say this is not the, the Olympics that uh, um, Japan had envisioned when they were uh, awarded the Games in, in Tokyo back in 2011, uh, in the middle of a, of a pandemic, no spectators, um, lots of domestic opposition to this with, with protests and so on. Um, but, you know, given all of those limitations, can it still be seen as a success? And how is that success measured? Well, that is a difficult question. And that really depends on which stakeholder is being given that question, right? So for the IOC, they will most definitely say this is gonna be a success because their main income comes from TV rights um, and it's a TV only event now. Well, if you talk to the Japanese population, the thing looks very, very different um, uh, as they're being shut out from the games, but they're being held there. They were very cautious about uh, the possibility of um, uh, different virus, virus mut mutations coming into the country, um, you know, 200 countries coming into their city. Um, when you look at the Japanese government, the costs are tremendous. Um, when you look at the sponsors, a lot of them have now declined uh, TV ads. They kind of stepped back because they didn't want the negative fallout from this. Um, so uh, it really depends who you're talking to. Ross Griffin, um, we talked there at the top about, about this whole idea of soft power and how uh, uh, nations use the uh, Olympics as a stage to promote that sort of, of soft power with, with um, you know, the accomplishments of athletes. Um, but in terms of, of the host nation, uh, Japan, um, 
what impact has 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 hosting the Olympics in, under these conditions had on 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 what they were hoping to get out of these games? Um, I think the games has been successful from an athletics point of view for the Japanese Olympic Committee. Um, they're higher in the table than they would historically be. So it's given them a chance to demonstrate that they are as accomplished in other fields, such as athletics, athletics as they would be in what they would be stereotypically, stereotypically be conceived of as technology in other areas like that. Um, it shows it allows it shows that they can compete, I suppose, alongside the other G7 nations. If you look at the medal table, it's got the usual characters of China, America, Britain, Australia, and are known as the Russian Olympic Committee. And Japan is sitting or sat very comfortably alongside them. I think they're fourth or fifth currently in the medals table, which is, as I said, historically much higher than they normally would be. Yeah, Great Britain, you mentioned there, is an interesting um, example that we can come back to uh, in terms of their, their sporting achievements at the Olympics over the last few years. But I, I want to get... Um, the view of, of, of Richard now on this. What do you think should be the legacy of the Tokyo Olympics? Well, I think they can be called the Compromise Olympics or the Television Olympics. I personally thought they should have been delayed another year to have the full effect with the fans there and spectators from overseas, but that didn't happen, so we have to live with it now. And so I think the legacy will be got through COVID, a few hiccups along the way. We've only got five days to go. We'll see what happens with the Paralympics, but they'll be known as the compromised or television Olympics that went ahead. The IOC pushed forward on that. A delay till 2022 could have could have occurred, but that didn't. So they're going to be back on track. And as you pointed out, there's only three years till Paris to the next summer games and less than six months till the Beijing winter games. But that might be another political hot potato between now and when they take place. Uh, Barbara, I saw you nodding in agreement to uh, to some of that about this idea of that, that perhaps it should have been delayed another year uh, to 2022 so you could get all the crowds in there. Um, talk talk a little bit more about that. Why you think that? Yeah. Well, I mean, the hopes and wishes that Japan connected with these games were manifold. Uh, on the one hand, of course, they wanted 40 million tourists from abroad getting into the country. Uh, in 2020, and now the country has been completely locked, except to Olympic-related people, for a year and a half, right? Uh, so that is huge. So they can't showcase themselves. Um, they can't get any financial benefits from selling these seats. So there's, um, economically, it's really, really difficult. And it's, of course, difficult to sell to the people who have been over half a million people have been losing their jobs. And of course, it's hard to tell people to, and that's what the Japanese government has been doing over and over in these many states of emergency, please, you know, do self-restraint. Don't go out, don't drink alcohol, right? Uh, don't go to restaurants, don't mingle. Uh, but yet then the world comes together in the city. And so that's why, partially why we see this large increase now in COVID cases in the city. Uh, Ross Griffin, how, how important is, uh, you know, the achievement of, of, of medals at the Olympics for, for countries? And I suppose it does depend to, to an extent on which country you're talking about. I mean, if you, if you look at the example of, of, of Great Britain um, and the, the, the decision that was made back in the late 90s, um, they, had a, they had a terrible Olympics back in 1996. Uh, they won one gold medal, finished, I think it was 37th in the podium and a decision was made right after that to 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 pump a lot more money into into grassroots sports into sports that that would help them win olympic gold medals and since then they've had a huge measure of success and uh, you know you know getting into the the medals podium in, in in sort of around fifth or sixth in the in the medals table pretty much every olympic since uh, uh, beijing so it does show you that, that that this kind of thing does matter for a country's uh, uh, prestige and with Britain, we're not we're not talking about China or, or you know authorita or an authoritarian nation. It, it is it is a kind of uh, a projection of soft power, isn't it, for, for for many of these countries? Oh, it very much is. Um, the medal table is always something that's very keenly watched by spectators and I imagine politicians as well. 
It's important to note, though, that every different every country has a different agenda almost when it comes to the medal tables. You have the traditional superpowers of sport, America, China, and Russia would always be looking to use the medal table to assert their own spin on society, that their own social model is better than others. But when it comes to nations, particularly Britain, coming out of the backdrop of what seems to be a very confused and bungled Brexit process, um, what many experts deem to be a very, very poor mishandling of the COVID pandemic. Um, this is something that Boris Johnson and his peers in that Conservative government can cling on to, to can say, look, we're doing something right here. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they translate 15 or 16 gold medals into political capital, but that's the job of the politicians to do. But this trickles all the way down to states that wouldn't be as large or established as the Britons of the world or the Chinas or the Americans. If you look at the, I suppose what the, it's, it's, it's confusing when you look at them on an Olympics platform because they're designated as Chinese Taipei in the Olympic medal table, but Taiwan by any other name. It's important to know that they're 23rd on that medal table and that they use mega events, sporting events, such as the Olympics to establish a sense of legitimacy, a sense of identity outside of the umbrella of more dominant neighbors that wish to bring them back in. And that's where medal tables, they really are important for little and larger nations to assert a sense of national identity for whatever agenda is deemed necessary at the time. Uh, Barbara, when we talk about national identity, uh, the, the, the opening ceremony is always a big opportunity, is, isn't it, for, 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 uh, for that host nation to kind of set out their stall. It's a kind of, it's a huge PR uh, spectacle in, in, in that sense. What did you, what did you make of, of, of what we saw in, in Tokyo almost a couple of weeks ago now? Yeah, I thought the symbolic power and many of these ideas in the opening ceremony were really um, strong. And uh, for example, uh, you had asked earlier about, you know, the goals and hopes and desires of the Olympics. And one was to show how inclusive Japan is and how diverse Japan is. And inclusion, you could really see in the opening ceremony in regards to having a lot of people with disabilities, people in wheelchairs participating um, in the ceremony. You had Naomi Osaka uh, lighting the cauldron, uh, who is multiracial Japanese. And uh, that has huge symbolic power, as well as the Japanese flag bearer, uh, who is a basketball player, Hachimura. And uh, he's also multiracial. And, uh, and so to choose these two in these very exposed positions really um, supported this desire uh, of showing how diverse Japan has become. Richard, what, what do you make of um, this idea that's been put out that, you know, the, soft, the, the whole soft power thing doesn't matter so much, doesn't have the same impact that it used to uh, for countries, and, and it's become more... Uh, about the personalities, uh, and when you when you look at what happened with Simone Biles, um, the, the American uh, gymnast, and her decision to uh, not to compete in in, in certain events because uh, she said she was looking out for her mental um, health. That that is something that got um, a lot a great deal of coverage um, in the media and had some asking whether th this is this is really um, uh, more of a of a platform for has become more of a platform for athletes than, than their nations. What, what do you make of that idea? Well, of course, the IOC's uh, Athletes Commission has gotten more powerful and they've just voted some new members on as they change them around. So they've uh, definitely increased their profile, the athlete side. And the whole Olympic issue with respect to politics has, has changed. Of course, boycotts, we haven't seen a boycott since 84 when it was the tit for tat when the... Um, Soviet and led nations didn't uh, come to LA and that was in, in uh, sort of punishment for the Americans and their boycott supporters not going to Moscow. So boycotts haven't occurred. So when we got to 88 in Seoul, they were boycott free and everyone went, wow, this is great. No boycotts, normal Olympics. And I think as you've identified, it's gone back to more of an athlete focus now. I was noticed the other day, there was a Chinese competitor in one of the sports and 
another athlete was treating that competitor, you know, just as if they were any other athlete from around the world. And there could have been some, some animosity there because issues are going on in, in Beijing with respect to the a Winter Games in 2022. But yeah, they just seem their athletes are athletes and they don't really want to um, do too much in terms of inflaming the situation there to train, win medals. And they kind of stay out of the political forum. There has only been, I think, one little, little small protest that the OC didn't want to occur, but they've put things in place to, to punish athletes and might do that. But uh, yeah, I think we've seen that all diminish boycotts and issues that happen. It's gone more to an athlete focus. Uh, Barbara, people say that um, uh, that sport, that uh, uh, politics should should have no business being involved in in sport at all, and and vice versa. But do you think that's perhaps an, a, a naive view? Because when when we look all through history, the two have never been far apart. And and when you have a a stage as large as the Olympic Games, that's always going to be an opportunity for certain people, whether they be countries or individual athletes. To, uh, to 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 put forward their their agenda, so to speak. What do you? What's your take on that? Oh, I think um, it, that's of course immediately tied to each other. I don't think there could be such a mega event, uh, the world's largest mega event, without a serious involvement of politics, because there's so much money involved um, and and national prestige that is being pushed and certain agendas and um, I think that strong those strong ties I think they're not going to get any less over time uh, Ross Griffin what, what's your take on that and the way in the terms of the way different different countries uh, approach that narrative um, like politics and sports have always been intertwined, has and then it's particularly in the Olympic Games, given the sheer prestige surrounding the event. And this goes back to the early 1900s. You had Irish athletes at the 1906 Games protesting British colonization. They brought their own flag, and this resurfaced again in 1972 when you had Irish cyclists, an alternate Irish cycling team in the 72 Games interrupted the road race. Um, you've already mentioned the games involving South Africa in the early 60s and Jesse Owen and the 70 or 36 Munich games also. So it's always it's always been a part of um, the Olympic Games. Um, I know that the IOC has tried to minimize or diminish this, the, the, the amount of protest or any opportunity for protest in this games and bar the American shot putter that was mentioned earlier, I don't think, I haven't seen any sign or scene of it um, in these games so far. I don't think you can eliminate it completely once you have people inside involved in these games, human beings, you're always going to have some risk of protest. Um, it's just a part and parcel of the Olympic Games. Uh, speaking of protest and politics, um, Richard, I know that this was mentioned earlier about the, um, the, uh, the winter uh, games that are coming up in, in Beijing in, in early 2022 and the real possibility of, a, of some sort of international boycott there because of uh, the Chinese government's treatment of um, the Uyghur people. Um, back in 2008, when, when China hosted the Summer Olympics, there, again, there were concerns raised about the human rights record, but of course nothing happened there. The, the Games were seen as a huge success for China. But are things different this time around, though? Yes, they are. I come from uh, Australia and currently in Canada, and they've got two issues with China at the moment. The, the Australians have had so many tariffs put on their trade with China. China bullying Australia, a smaller nation with lots of raw, raw resources that they need. And Canada's had the two Michaels. There's two Canadian diplomats that are being held there, and they've been over a year. And so they've got that issue. And will that be resolved before the Beijing Games, both of those aspects of the Australian situation and the Canadian situation. And there's talk of boycotts, moving the games, delaying them another year. The National Olympic Committees don't want that. They just want to compete. They don't want the politics to enter into it, but we can't help and avoid that that might occur because of the strong political, you know, problems that are on at the moment. China won't want to give up the games. They you know, spent all this money. It's the first time a games will be in a same city for winter and summer. That's a first. And they've got the infrastructure done and they'll, they'll run technically a very good games. So they don't want that to occur. And if, 
they move the games, China might be willing to pull out of the Olympic movement. It's a shame they're current first on the medal tally. So the world doesn't want to see that. Neither does the IOC. And I don't think the athletes want to see that. So we're in a situation, an interesting six months to see if there'll be a lobby to have some changes occur for the Beijing games. An interesting six months. Barbara, what, what do you think uh, is likely to happen with those winter games in, in, in early 2022? Well, what I wanted to mention, because you earlier said that, you know, the postponement was only by one, and I think maybe um, Richard said that, but uh, that ideally it would have been better to postpone it for two years, uh, but it was decided against. And, you know, there were many reasons why, but one probably is also that Japan really wanted to hold these Olympics because there's always been that rivalry between Japan and China. And uh, to be the first nation to hold, um, well, it's not anymore post-pandemic, but pandemic games um, was really important for Japan and not to give uh, uh, that to China. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. Um, it's, there's, you know, every day things change so much that I would not dare to uh, give any assumptions what we're going to be seeing in the next six months. Fair enough. Um, uh, Ross Griffin, um, if, if, uh, if, if some sort of a boycott does happen, and I'm not saying it will for, for, for China in, in, um, in, uh, for uh, Beijing in 2022, what, what will be the ramifications of that, do you think? Um, it's hard to say. Um, in my own personal opinion, I think money talks in these things. So I don't see any boycott. I don't see any boycott happening. I don't see any delay in the games happening. Um, if contracts are signed by television companies and sponsors, I think the games are going to go ahead. If you want some hint as to how things could pan out, I think looking at the Russian Olympic Committee team, as it's called, in these games might give you some clue. Um, in all of these boycotts, it's incredibly unfair to punish the athletes. I think who have spent their entire lives, not just four-year segments, training for each of these individual games. So they, if there was a boycott, it would be largely symbolic with the athletes still being allowed to compete, albeit under the mishmash of different colored track suits and songs instead of anthems that we currently see with the Russian Olympic Committee, which is still a Russian team. It has all the markers of nationalism down to the red, white and blue track suits that they wear on the podium, but it's just not called a Russia team on the medal stable. Uh, yeah, what, what did you make of that, uh, Richard? The fact that um, uh, Russian athletes are still essentially allowed to compete. They just can't com compete under the Russian uh, flag. Um, does, does, does that seem like a, uh, a, a sort of com compromise that, that didn't really address the issue? Yes, yeah, so it definitely was a small slap on the wrist. So for all intents and purposes there they've got a team there uh, they just can't play their anthem but you know they can count the medal tally although it's under roc instead of russia uh, it's really a small slap on the wrist uh, some uh, athletes i think it was american swimmer uh said well, i wonder what would happen if i that russian athlete wasn't here hinting at uh, some drug issues still there but the athletes are the ones that are punished so it's a small slap in the wrist i think uh, very shortly we'll see russia back in full swing and very well in beijing which those games will be interesting because we've got the six months to see. And the only thing they've talked about some countries is some minor changes to how they might support the games. For example, politicians and key people from countries might not go to Beijing. They might stay home. So they wouldn't have this, China wouldn't be able to use the, you know, the aura of all the top officials in the world, politicians and others coming. So there could be some things that occur with respect to that. Athletes may be doing some type of protest in support of the Uyghurs, uh, despite the IOC regulations. So yeah, money talks, as Ross said, so it's, uh, Rob said, so it's it's gonna be interesting. I, I don't think anyone wants to see them canceled. And so I think they'll go ahead, but it'll be interesting six months between now and then. All right, we'll have to leave, leave it there. Thanks very much, all three of you, uh, Richard Barker, Barbara Holtus and Ross Griffin, thanks very much for being on Inside Story. And thank you, as always, for watching. Remember, you can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward 
slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hazem Seeker, and the whole team here, bye for now.